Thanksgiving uh, series this weekend. And uh, so I want to ask as we dive into this, um, we're just going to look at some, specifically some Old Testament stories um, where we can, um, there, there's just a lot of, a lot of material, a lot of things we can gain from these specific stories um, that are shared, through, shared with us through Scripture, um, specifically when it comes to this idea of courage. Uh, let me just say, uh, fear is not of God, okay? Let me just say, fear is not of God. So just keep that in mind. In fact, let me encourage you to take notes. Go ahead and turn with me. I know your worship order says uh, Joshua uh, chapter 1, but I want you to ask if you will. Go ahead and turn Joshua chapter 1, but also go to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. Um, to get to Joshua, we got to get through Numbers, uh, specifically this chapter, chapter 13. And uh, so I want to uh, just encourage you, uh, turn with me in your Bibles, whatever format you have the Bible uh, with you this weekend. And then also encourage you to take notes. And uh, um, that just uh, specifically through this series, I just want to, uh, you heard me say this all throughout uh, this series, to take notes, write this down. And uh, so um, so just to, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, we do this quite often, just kind of gets our mindset, but I want you to turn to the person to the right or left, and I want you to say, take notes. Take good notes. For me. Okay? So, uh, so somehow you're getting notes, and somehow you're able to go back, and you're able just to dive in this, um, and to refocus, and maybe to look at specific passages of Scripture. Also, let me encourage you, our messages are online, our teaching times are online. Uh, so the opportunity to uh, share uh, what we are talking about specifically on a weekend with others um, is a is a tool for us to use. But I want to I want you to finish this sentence for me. You got it. I want you to finish this sentence for me. But before I get to the sentence, I'll give you the sentence in a minute. Some of you are going, okay, what's the sentence? But I want you to uh, um, I'll give it to you in a minute. But down through the years, uh, God has positioned me and placed me, given me various opportunities um, to sit down with various organizations, um, businesses, specifically small businesses and churches, and just talk to them about different things, structure, leadership, uh, just different things about growth and all different kinds of concepts. And down to the years, I've had the great privilege to meet a lot of people and be in a lot of great conversations because of where God positioned me at different times in my life. I say all that because during those specific times that I've had that opportunity, there, is, there are different things that we walk through or I talk with different organizations or churches or businesses, um, different exercises that we will do. But one of them, and, and this isn't new, a lot of you have done this in your workplace or you did this at, at various, maybe you went to a workshop or a, a conference or something and, and speaker or in the group that you were with, they did the same thing. So it's not a new concept, but I loved, one of the exercises I love to do involves the idea of dreaming. I love the idea, this concept of dream, dreams, and not only to dream, but also to put pen to paper, or better yet, when I meet with different organizations that God has allowed me to meet with, putting pen to post a note. To actually write wherever I'm meeting with them, to write all over the walls or whatever with post-it notes and stick them and talk about the dreams that they have. Um, and so here's the question, okay? And I want you to finish this sentence, not out loud. If you, uh, Let me encourage you to write it down in your notes so you don't have to finish the sentence out loud. But I do want to ask you to finish this sentence. I start, and here, here's the way I, I here's the way if, I'm, if we were in just like one of this exercise, here's the way I would start it. And in fact, there might be multiple senses. And so, so from this standpoint, I start by asking, if money was no option, if, if money was, a, if there was an unlimited supply of money, and you knew you couldn't fail, y'all following me? So money's no option. Can I get an Amen. Okay, money's no option. And you knew there's no way you possibly could fail. What would you do? You don't have to answer out loud. If you want to, write down. Let me encourage you, actually. Write it down in your notes. What would you do? Maybe there's multiple things. 
If money was no option, the unlimited supply, and you just, there's no way you could fail, what would you do? What would you do? Now, down to the years, I am always amazed as when I start seeing, and people start writing down, and I said, like I used to post and I said, this, or, or a marker board or something, or multiple marker boards, that they go up and they start sharing their dreams. They start writing down their dreams, whether it be for the church, whether it be for that organization, whether it be for that company, that business, what it is. They just start writing down their dreams. And I've been in rooms, I've seen the rooms just covered, all the walls just covered, whether it be post-it notes or marker boards or whatever, just with dreams that everybody had written down. And then on top of those dreams, then start walking through and saying, okay, wait a minute. They start to see, and people start to see that they have, a lot of people have the same dreams. Well, I didn't know you two had thought about that. I didn't know that that was would, something you, I thought that was the only one thinking that way. You're thinking that way too? And to see, and then on top of that, then to start to walk through and positioning, and a lot of times, here's what happens. A lot of times, whether it be an individual that I've talked with, Groups of people, a church, organization, business, whatever it is, they start to realize that, wait a minute, the dreams that they have aren't so far away or aren't so unattainable or aren't where they can't be reached. But actually, through just sometimes even a few steps, the dreams that they thought couldn't be reached actually could be reached. Actually was possible. I've actually seen over the multiple, over several years, and I'm sure you have too, whether it be individually, groups of people, a business, a church that actually started to see and their dreams started to come together and they started to work through those dreams. But over the course of time, they started to experience what I, I bet almost all of you already in this room have experienced. See, at the very beginning, we started to say, write your dreams down. If you knew that money was owed no option, you knew you couldn't fail, then to write that down, and what would that look like, and what would it be, whether it be for you individually, whether it be for the church, whether it be for the place you work. We all have dreams, but here's the thing. As soon as you thought about what that one thing was, if you allowed yourself to do that, your probably next thought was, like so many organizations or churches or individuals will think was, well, that's the stupidest exercise I've ever heard. I'm not going to participate in that. That's crazy. I'm not going to even bother to write that down. Why would we even talk about that in a message? Or some of you, maybe immediately your mind went to right after you thought about that. Well, you know what? I'm not even going to bother to write that down. That'll never happen. Maybe you thought, well, there's too much risk involved. I have too much to lose. Maybe some of you thought, I'm too old. I'm too young. But here's the reason why, down to the years, I got to participate in it, and I love participating, and down to the years, why, whether it be meeting with an individual, or groups of people, or with a church leadership, or with uh, small groups, or whatever that looks like, or business, whatever, the reason I love this is because, and to do this exercise, is specifically this one, because the truth is we all carry dreams. We all carry dreams. Now some of us have positioned ourselves in our lives where because of multiple things that are going on, we, we're, we don't dream or we don't feel we can dream or we don't allow ourselves to dream. Because of what? Because we just think, well, that's stupid or that will never happen. So therefore, we, where we maybe used to dream, we don't dream anymore. We don't have ideas anymore. We don't allow our minds to dream about things anymore. But here's the thing. Many of those dreams, that I found out down through the years were actually God-given dreams that were given to us. But 
But here's the thing. Instead of pursuing our dreams or giving our dreams a chance or trying to start positioning ourselves. Like I said, I've seen this happen so often in individuals' lives. I sit down with an individual, walk through maybe a few a counseling session. This is one exercise I would do with someone uh, specifically in wherever they're at in life and walk through this. And they start to, we start to say, well, if I do this, this, and this, hey, wait a minute, that's not so far obtainable. Maybe it's to go back to school. Maybe it's whatever that looks. Maybe it's to leave uh, the job that they're in to move, pursue another career, whatever it is, and start to walk through. But whether it be an individual, a group of people, a business, a church, so often, instead of pursuing our dreams or giving our dreams a chance, we become paralyzed with this word. We become paralyzed with fear. And those dreams just stay dreams. They just stay dreams. And even a sadder case is that, like I said, that they don't just stay dreams, but we stop dreaming. We stop dreaming. We, we allow our minds to go back to what used to be. Whether it be our childhood, whether it be whatever it is, we think back and we go, what? Well, we think about, oh, the good old days. You ever heard somebody say, well, back in the good old days. You ever heard somebody say that? Yeah? Yes. I've seen whether it be individually, groups of people, business, church, back in the old good old days. I want you to imagine after completing the sentence, I, I, I kind of reverse our way of thinking. I want us to think, if we will, and allow ourselves, and again, this requires all participation, that after we completed that sentence, and I, I want to, hopefully you participated, because I think you're robbing yourself, and we're robbing ourselves, if we don't participate, again, that's my opinion, you can argue, but that's my opinion. But, but after that, that we didn't allow ourselves to go to this idea, well, that's stupid. We didn't allow, but we actually, we actually allowed ourselves to hear God say these words. After we allowed ourselves to think through that dream, we allowed ourselves, or before we even allowed our minds to go, we actually can hear the voice of God, the Spirit of God rising up and speaking to us, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. So over the next several weeks, what we're going to do is this series. We're going to look at men and women in the Old Testament that bumped up, up against incredible challenges, impossible tasks. We're going to look at how they were able to rise up and to gather up the courage, the momentum, the desire to keep moving forward, to actually stand up for whatever the cost have the courage. Somehow they found the courage they needed. And like I said at the very beginning, I want to encourage you to take notes. I want to challenge each and every one of us to take notes, write things down. Some of you know, I'm a drawler, I'm a doodler, so a lot of times if you were to look at my notes when I'm sitting where you're sitting, a lot of times I will have little cartoon characters, and they're not the best in the world, so, but, that, but maybe that's not you. Maybe, you know, it's writing, writing out long or thinking through, but I just want to encourage you how God can teach each one of us as we move forward, because the end of this year is almost over. The end of this year is almost here. This year is almost over. Can you believe that? How can we learn from these stories to help us to be courageous today? And the first two lines I want us to look at this weekend, that I want to dive into this weekend, is the life of Joshua and Caleb. Say Joshua and Caleb for me. Joshua and Caleb. Now, Joshua and Caleb, just some important things we need to know about them and their lives. Joshua and Caleb are Israelites. They have been enslaved by the Egyptians for hundreds and hundreds of years. But just like 
all the Israelites, they've been holding on to this promise that had been given to them several years before. And again, they're in captivity. They're enslaved by the Egyptians, but they're still holding on to the promise of God that God gave them, that God would deliver them, that God would give them this land. And because it was promised to them by God, it is called, it has a name, we call it what? Anybody know? God doesn't go to sleep on me. Anybody know? The promised land, yes. Why is it called the promised land? Because it was a promise given to God that he would give them this land. So they called it a real creative idea. Let's just call it the promised land. And all through, even in captivity, even with the Egyptians, you imagine, can you just thinking around, thinking about allowing your minds to go there and think about what they've been, man, if we could just get there, I wonder what that land will be like. Man, that's gonna, when's, when's this going to happen? And all that, whole trying to hold on to that promise. And here's the thing, the time came that they are actually set free. And the escape from the Egyptians. And in becoming free, and in becoming free, though, they end up in the wilderness. Now, I'm not going to be dabbling in this too long, but I bet a lot of us right now feel like we're in the wilderness. That we're just wandering. That we're lost. The children of Israel, the people of Israel, they ended up in the wilderness. And just like the Israelites, we have dreams. We even these promises, if you knew that you couldn't fail, if you knew that money was no option. Some of you, again, maybe you don't have dreams because you don't allow yourself to dream. Maybe you feel like, like I mentioned, that your life is in the middle of a wilderness. But in the middle of the, all this, this is what transpires. Over in Numbers, this is why I had you go to Numbers. Over in Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, we see that Moses, God tells Moses to pick 12 leaders, 12 scouts, to go out into the land. And in verse 1, it says, The Lord now said to Moses, Send out men to explore the land of Canaan and the land I am giving to the Israelites. Now, whatever format you have the Bible on, I want you to circle that or highlight that where it says, uh, Send out men to explore the land Canaan. The land what? What does it say? The land what? Circle that word giving. How many of you, for most of us, whether it be online or in person, maybe have read that before, seen that before. How many of us realize that, he, that when God said to Moses, send out scouts, he said, send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving. God's already saying, I'm giving you this land. Catch that. Make sure you write that down. God's already said, I'm giving you the land. Now remember, they were already holding on to the promise of the land that God had already promised to them years before. Now, God is saying to Moses, I'm giving you this land. He says, send one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. And two of the 12 that were chosen had the names Joshua and Caleb. See, these 12 go and they're gone for 40 years. Long days. Say 40 days. 40, 40 days. days. <clears throat> and what do you think started to happen when they were gone that long? The people started to grumble. I wonder where they're at. Where did they go? Why haven't they come back? Will we ever see them again? Finally, after 40 days, the 12 scouts come back and they actually report on what they experience. And actually the very first part of the report is pretty exciting. There's a lot of excitement behind it. Look what it says there in verse 27 of Numbers 13. It says, there was, this was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it, and it is indeed a bountiful, what? Country. Country. 
Now, circle or highlight that word bountiful. This is, it goes on to say, these are the scouts speaking to Moses. And you imagine by now the audience that's around, they're pressing in. Can you hear? Tell them to speak up louder. I can't hear what they're saying. What's going on? What, what did they find? I want to hear it. And they say, a land flowing with milk and honey. How many had any milk this morning? Anybody put any honey on their toast? Bagel? It goes on. Here's the kind of fruit it produces. Now, talking about this land. It says, then, then, it, then if you look there, it says, then they bring out this cluster of grapes. And the cluster of grapes is so large that actually they have them on poles and it takes two guys to carry these grapes. The people, can you imagine? They're excited. Wow! Can you imagine what we can do? Can you imagine the pies we can make with all that? If the grapes are like, can you imagine what everything else looks like? It must be amazing. The people had to be thinking, this is it. This is the promised land. This is what we've been waiting on. But here's, check this out. Look, look at what happens. Just as start as this dream, just as start as they see it become reality, just as soon as start as they start to see it rise up, I've seen it over and over again, with whether it be individually or people or, or even, so to say, even in the church, I've seen it where they start to see things come up. They start to see God moving in their lives. They start to see dreams start to move. They start to see things positioning. They are on the verge, they are on the cuff of experiencing a miracle. And then it dies. The dream dies. It dies. Why? Because of one word that I, I would dare say that we're all guilty of using. You may be even already used it this morning. You may be already right now are using this word. This one word that was spoken by the ten scriptures. <laughs> Look what it says in verse 28. Numbers 13, verse 28. It says, but. Some of you are going, can we even say this word, church? <laughs> but. Look what it says. But the people living there are powerful. In other words, these are the scouts being the same. But the people living there, we have to tell you, they're powerful, and their towns are large, and they're fortified. We even saw giants. The descendants, descendants of Anik that are living there. These ten scouts report. Now, we might be asking, who is this? What, what a minute, giant, giants? Some of us are always thinking, well, this story is hard enough to comprehend as it is. And now you're saying giants? What? Who's Anik? Well, Anik was this, this, this incredible giant, probably a descendant of Goliath. And if you are familiar at all with the story of David and Goliath, this is probably in relation, probably had there's some relation there to Goliath. But here's the thing. As soon as the people start to hear this, they got all excited. They see, can you imagine? The grapes are brought out. Going, you know, I imagine somebody's going up trying to touch the grapes. Don't you touch that. Leave that alone. That's so good. I want to eat it. The excitement. You got, we got to allow ourselves to experience the excitement. It's so important that you allow ourselves, that we allow ourselves to experience the excitement of where the Israelites were to understand what happens next. Because what happens next is the ten scouts say, but. And it's like, Well, that stinks. We got giants. <coughs> the cities are fortified. In other words, you ever been where the air was just let out of the room? Imagine as soon as the people hear this. They're no longer thinking about a land flowing with milk and honey. 
where um, instead of what even is in front of them, they could taste it, they could smell it, they could feel it. It's right in front of them with this cluster of grapes and other things that they brought with them, but that didn't matter. All they heard was, but the cities are fortified, but there's giants. They're all caught up on that word, but. And we all probably, this weekend, whether we be online or in person, probably can all relate to that word, that powerful word, but. That's a good idea. That's a great idea, but. I think we probably, I think we ought to do this. I think we could do this, but. Yes, I, uh, I, you are important to me. Yes, I love you, but. See, here's truth. Say word, say truth for me. Here's truth. There were giants. And the cities were fortified. And it was going to be hard. And it wasn't just going to be something that was just going to come to them. Just because they carried the title Israelites didn't mean, okay, everything was going to be easy and everything was just going to be there. Yes. It was going to be hard, and yes, there are giants. But there was also giants back with David. And David and Goliath. And even in our lives today, in our culture, society today, we're faced with, if you will, giants. Impossible stuff, impossible things, things that seem crazy, things that just seem way out there. And we're trying to overcome. So, in your notes, you can write this down, don't say, what are those for you? What are those giants for you? What are those impossible things for you? What is it? If you're willing, if you want to really get into the meat of it, what is it that maybe stops you from dreaming? That won't allow you to dream anymore? Whether it be individually, whether it be about your family, whether it be about the church, what is it that happened that you you just your dreams you just don't dream anymore? Those impossible stuff, those worries, those challenges between here and there. Can we just say it? Can we just get it out? Can we just talk about that elephant in the room? That is, because of the giants, maybe we end up just sitting on our... Y'all fill in the blank. We just end up sitting. If I knew I couldn't fail, I would... You fill in the blank, but I'm too young. You're too young. Wait till you get a little older. You're too young. You're too old to serve in that position right now. You haven't learned enough. You need. You need to. You need. You need to get. You need to get a little rough. You need to. You need to learn some more. Maybe down the road. You're too old. Too old. Oh, that's for the younger ones. Well, the younger, younger ones can't yet, but that's for the younger ones because I'm too old. We all get stuck on our butts. And some of you even right now in your mind, one minute, but you're already filling in the thing. To the scouts took a different view, though. To the scouts took a different view. Look at verse, verse 30. It says, verse 30, But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once and take the land, he said. 
We can certainly conquer it. Notice what it says. Let's go at once and take the land. We can certainly conquer it. See, here's the thing. Joshua and Caleb, they can see it. They can taste it. They can envision it. They said, who cares if they're giants? Who cares if the cities are fortified? Don't you see what's in front of us? Don't you touch this grape, these grapes. Smell the aroma. So this look how amazing. Imagine if we all took out, imagine if they would have had uh, their iPhones in or smart devices in and said, let me show you pictures. And then maybe Caleb scrolled through the pictures saying, don't you see how amazing this is, how beautiful? Look at verse 31 and 32. It says, but the other men, say other men. Other men. But the other men who had explored the land with them disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. How do you know? You've been enslaved. You survived that. How do you know? But they say they're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were what? Huge. Huge. They're huge. Now write this down. Put this in your notes. Even if you're not taking notes, at least turn to the person beside you and say, write this down for me. I'm going to need this. Write this down for me. I'm going to need this. In big words, in all caps, I want you to write this word. I want you to write the word warning. In big caps, write it out, a warning. Just write the word out, warning. And beside the word warning, I want you to write this. When courage is called for. When courage is called for. When courage is required to rise up within us. You, it, it's a guarantee that it will, it, at some form, it will always happen. When courage is called for, negativity will spread. When courage is called for, negativity will grow. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, look, look with me at Numbers over chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. Look what it says. It says, Then the whole community began weeping out loud. I can't help but chuckle. The whole community began weeping out loud. And they cried all night. The people, they're all moaning and crying. They're going to the garden to eat worms. Their voices rose in great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. And look what they say. Look at these words. If only we had died where? Egypt. If only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they complained. You see, here's the thing. When someone decides to move forward, when someone start, decides to rise up, and they're not going to give power to fear, but they're going to rise up in courage toward their dreams, there will always be those who will complain. There will always be people who will revolt and say to one another, look what it says. It, it will look maybe in different form, but there will always be people Look at Numbers chapter 14, verse 4, look what it says. Then they plotted amongst themselves. Let's choose a new leader and go back to where? Egypt. Seriously. <laughs> We've been praying and praying and praying. We've been hoping and dreaming that God would give us this land that we have entitled the promised land. Why? Because it's promised by God. Moses is told by God, I want you to go and send 12 men to go scout out the land that I am giving to you. And they want to get rid of the leadership. They want to go back and appoint new leaders to take them back to Egypt to be enslaved. <laughs> 
look at how Joshua and Caleb respond. Verse 6 of chapter 14, it says, Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua and Caleb. Here's what's happened. Joshua and Caleb, what does it do? What does it say they do? What do they do? You read it for me. What does it say they do? They tore their clothes. I cannot believe that you people are acting like this. In other words, did they follow the crowd? Did they join in with the crowd? Did they give up their dreams? Did they give in to fear? Write in your notes this word. No. No. But all the others did. The ten scouts and all the others. In other words, the people of Israel all rallied around the ten scouts. They all rallied around the word but. They all rallied around the idea that, hey, we need, this is not going to work. It's so important that we understand this. It's so important that we allow our minds specifically as far as Christ, specifically at the church, individually, that we allow ourselves to understand what took place. Because this is mon monumental in the history of the people of Israel. Because of this, because they rallied around those ten scouts, because they said, we can't do this. If you go back and study what happens to the people of Israel from that point, what happens to them for the next 40 years? They wander around in the wilderness for the next 40 years. They are on the verge, on the cup of entering to the promised land and for the next 40 years they wander around in the wilderness. Forty years later, we got to move quick, forty years later we find the Israelites again on the edge of the promised land. Say on the edge. Okay. Forty years later, they're on the edge of the promised land. They're faced with the same decision again, right there on the edge. This land is still amazing. It's still flowing with milk and honey. It still has all this amazing stuff, but guess what? It still has giants, and the cities are still fortified. But here's the thing. Only two, a lot of us miss this, only two, Of who was there in their 20s as very young men who were called out to go scout, there's only two that are still alive. Do y'all understand what happened? What was going on in those 40 years? They were on the verge of entering into the promised land. They say, No, we're not going to do this. We're too afraid. So, 40 years they wander around. Why? A generation dies off. Till they're finally on the cusp again, and the only are two there, and that's Caleb and Joshua. On the cusp of entering to the promised land. Now think this through in a minute. Uh, I want you all to think through. If they were young men, and they're approximately somewhere, or maybe somewhere in their 20s, and 40 years would make them how old now? 60. Y'all quiet on me. <laughs> Thank you. Y'all don't say, I don't want to say that. Because y'all know where I'm going next. They were how old? If they're 40 years, in the 20s, somewhere in their what age? 60. Can I get an amen? Amen. Some of you are going in your mind, oh, no. Because if you know the history of Israel, you're going, wait a minute, I'm just getting started. No, 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 I know. I'm not getting started. If you know, but it's just getting started for the, for the people of Israel. Only two are still alive to see the land the second time. This is the moment. Joshua is now leading God's people. And he hears, uh, who's leading God's people now? Joshua. Hmm. Just saying. Joshua is leading God's people. And these are the words that he hears spoken to him. These are the words, Joshua chapter 1. But now, this is Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, verse 6. These are the words, that these changing words. These are the words that Caleb and Joshua held on to. 
These are the words that God speaks into Joshua. He says, be strong and what? Courageous. Courageous. Y'all be afraid. Be afraid. Now he says, be strong and courageous. It is in these words that Joshua and Caleb and God's people found the courage that they needed. The courage that 40 years earlier they had failed to move toward. They went in and claimed this promised land. And was it easy? If you look on through, you could see that it was not easy. They see the battles that were fought. But here's the thing. How do I take what we've talked about and how do we actually apply it to our lives? How do we take this story that God has given to us and actually how does it fit and mold into our lives today? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. How do we find courage to move forward against the giants in our own lives and as a church and as a people and in our families and at work? How do we find courage and the, question, and the answer to that question, isn't it amazing, is found right there in Scripture. Because here's the thing. A lot of us are familiar. A lot of us know the words, be strong and courageous. Some of us maybe even have it on a plaque or a picture. Be strong and courageous. But we don't know how to be strong and courageous. And so we're not aware that if you read on, that actually God tells us, this is how you're going to be strong and courageous. He just didn't tell Joshua, be strong and courageous. He actually gives the reason how and why. Look what it says there in verse 6. Again, some of us are just stuck on the word strong and courageous. It says, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors. I would give them. Look at those words. Be strong and courageous. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land. I swore to their ancestors I would give them. In other words, what have we been talking about for two years? Know the promises of God. Look at the promises all throughout Scripture and hold on to the promises of God. And that's exactly what, is, what God is saying to Joshua. Hold on. Focus on my promises. Why? Because my promises are true and I never break my promises. I never break. How important is it to know the promises of God? Well, there's all kinds of promises all through Scripture, but let me just give you two this weekend to hold on to. Promise number one, God's promise, that when you surrender your life to Christ, there's multiple gifts we receive, but there's one gift I want to really focus on, and that is when you Surrender your life to Christ. You get the gift of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's a promise. The same power, in other words, as a follower of Christ, the same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power as a follower of Christ that is living in you. That's a promise. God hasn't changed that promise. That's a promise. Promise number two. God's promise. Eternal life. Our word for the year is home. God's promise is, I will give you this gift, the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. If you will surrender to me, if you'll be a part of this relationship with me, I'll give you the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll give you this Holy Spirit. But then also, there's the promise of eternal life. Well, if we go around and say, well, if something was to happen or Jesus Christ return right now, would you spend eternity with him? A lot of even followers of Christ will say, I know I'm speaking fast. But a lot of followers of Christ will even say... Well, I would like to think that I'd spend eternity. Well, if you look, Paul says, no, that if you are a follower of Christ, then that is a promise. As a follower of Christ, to spend eternity with him. So the first thing that God says to Joshua, he says, be strong and courageous. And then he says, focus on the promises. Second thing is this. Look what it says in verse 7. He says, goes, be strong and what? I love this. Be strong and what? Courageous. Anybody ever catch that word very courageous? <laughs> be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from 
from them, turn either to the right or to the left. It says, it says turn it, it says, do not deviate from them, turn it either to the right or to the left. Then you, you will be successful in everything you do. In other words, what does God say? Obey my commands. Obey me. Focus on my promises. Be strong, courageous. Where's that? The ability to be strong, courageous? Focus on my promises and obey me. Now, I know I, I, I know I got speed up here, but here, what's it say? Turn to the person to your right left and say, write this down. Did anybody catch what he said? Did you? These are the words giving. Uh, some of you are going, oh. I'm telling you, some of you are going to go, oh. It's going to go, oh, for me. Go ahead and get out of the way. Because some of you are going to do that now when you see this. Because look what he says. This is God speaking to you. Don't go, oh, to me. You go, oh, to God. Okay? <laughs> Notice that God says, don't what? Turn to your what? Your right or your what? Yeah. I'm going to let that soak in for a minute. You say, I don't go to meddling now. Let that soak in. Don't go to your right. Don't go to your left. Now, written years ago, words delivered to Joshua. Be strong, courageous. Don't deviate from them. Don't do for my instruction, don't turn to the right or to the left. And today's culture tries to get what? Us to make decisions what? Based on the right or based on the left? No one said amen. Amen. In today's culture, they try to say what is true, either to the right or to the left. God says, no, you focus your thinking, your decisions, because it's true on my what? My word. You make your decisions in life. You make your decisions on my word. In other words, he said, focus on my promises. You obey me. In other words, God doesn't want us to be courageous about something that doesn't align to his word. God is saying, you let People of Israel, Joshua, you let my word be your God. But it doesn't stop there. Joshua says in verse 9, he says this. This is my command. Now, a lot of us miss this. I know I've gone over, so forget it. Okay, here's it. Say, this is my command. Say my command. My command. Did anybody ever notice this in this story? You ever see he said, God says, this is my command. Now, before I get to that, what did we just talk about? We are to obey God. Focus on his promises to obey God. When God says, this is my command, what is he saying? Obey. obey. This is my instruction. Obey it. This is my command. Be strong in what? How many of you knew that was even in scripture? Obey me, you are called, we are called to be strong and courageous. Wow. Let that sink in. I just saw something flippant that's out there. I'm saying, no, as a father of Christ, as the church, we're called to be strong and courageous. And it goes on to say, do not be afraid. Or discouraged. Wow, do not be afraid of discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever what? Wherever you go. In other words, God's just not here, whether it be online or here in right here, right now. God is with you everywhere. When you leave here in just a few minutes and you go get something to eat or you travel home and get something, God's there. When you go to work tomorrow morning or whatever it is your day looks like, you go meet a group of people for breakfast, whatever it is, God is there. Whatever you do this week, God is there. See, what God is saying to Joshua, what he's saying to us is, you focus on my promises. You obey me. 
And you have to trust that I am with you. And when we do that, he's saying to Joshua and he's saying to us, you will be strong. And you will be courageous. And he gives us this amazing word. As a reward. Let's pray. All right, my Father, I thank you so much.